Today we heard from Kirk Ferentz at the Iowa press conference. The injuries piling up for the Hawkeyes. We update you on everything happening on the injury front. Plus, the big question, the quarterback question. If poor play continues from Deacon Hill, how much longer can the Hawkeyes stick with them? Today, Locked On Hawkeyes. You are Locked On Hawkeyes, your daily podcast on the Iowa Hawkeyes. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome in. I'm Trent Condon, and this is the Locked On Hawkeyes podcast. Thanks for making Locked On Hawkeyes your first listen every day. We're available wherever you get podcasts. You can also find us on YouTube. While you're there, make sure you hit that subscribe button. It helps us get in front of more Hawkeye fans. Today's episode is brought to you by Prize Picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash locked on college and use code locked on college for a first deposit match up to $100. That's prizepicks.com slash locked on college today. With that, let's get into what we heard from earlier today from Iowa head football coach Kirk Ferentz. Also heard from a number of the players over in Iowa City as Iowa prepares for their final game of the opening stretch of the season before they get the bye game, the bye week uh, next week. Very important time, obviously, for this Iowa team that is so banged up. And really, that's where the conversation starts uh, here today with the injury front. You start with the news that we all anticipated. Eric all season has come to a close with the torn ACL. I think uh, anybody that has been watching football for a while, you saw that injury. You look at the way that the knee bent, and you also looked at the work that the training staff was doing. And he knew pretty quickly that that was going to be the likely scenario that played out. And it just did that. So Iowa now down their top two tight ends. Not only that, Addison Estrangle, who came in as the number three tight end as the season began. He has been banged up. He's been out with an undisclosed injury for the last couple of weeks. Uh, Kirk did mention today that he is back out there and practicing in a limited role. That's incredibly good because we've seen Steven Stilianos. Take a step up. We talked about the freshman Ortworth uh, being out there and and playing, obviously, get thrown into the fire last week against Wisconsin and, and doing at least a capable job out there. Hayden Large goes from fullback where he's played this year. He was a tight end a year ago. So you have some experience there. But when you talk about all three of those players, Stilianos, Hayden Large, and Ortworth at this point in his career, there's not the athlete that we're used to. Luke Lachey, Eric All, those guys are plus athletes at the tight end position. In the past, guys like Sam Laporta and George Kittle, and we can play this game on and on and on because it's tight end you, but you know where I'm going, the path that I'm heading down with this one. Those tight ends are built differently than the current stable out there. A strangle has got a little bit more wiggle to him. He's got a little bit more athleticism, and that's going to be incredibly important. Look, Iowa, I think, needs to continue to develop the passing game and do some of the things that Iowa does best. Though we haven't seen a ton of outside zone, we have seen inside zone plays that they've run along with the counter plays, along with the gap blocking that we've seen a whole lot more throughout the course of this season, even dating back uh, to a year ago. And it's really more forward here. And we're seeing finally that start to pay off a little bit, but getting a string back, getting a little athletic tight end, a guy that can run those drag routes. If you're going boot action, a waggles off of it, a guy that can help, not stretch the field at the same level as an Eric Arlo, Luke Lachey, but just a little bit more athleticism out there. I think that's an important part uh, for this offense. And we know these guys are going to have to block, right? Uh, that's something. Uh, very interesting article on Monday from Chad Leistico from the Des Moines Register. And he uh, went back and went through the different formations that Iowa did and how the running game worked out of different formations. It wasn't very good when they had two, three tight ends in there. And because of that, and certainly the 13 personnel, one running back, three tight ends out on the field because you're losing your top two guys. Do they go away from it? That scrap it completely. It's still going to be part of the Iowa identity, but something where, say, out of 50 snaps a game offensively, maybe in the past they were looking to run it 10, 12 times, something like that. That number drops down now. You know, it's four or five times. It's goal line situations, maybe a couple third and fourth and ones, those kind of things, and that's it. I certainly like to see it. 
I think this Iowa run game can improve even more, even if you spread things out more. Again, we've talked about the different schemes that we've seen out of this running game and what it can be, and that's at least a hope uh, that I'm looking for. So that's the tight end position. Uh, no surprise with Eric Hall. Maybe even more concerning because we all felt, I think, that all was going to be out was Y.A. Black. Y.A. Black has continued to stack his best game on top of each other. And though statistically last week, it wasn't a monster performance from him. Go back and watch the tape as I did on Sunday night and rewatch the game. And you can just see how good he was at occupying space, uh, making it incredibly difficult on that Wisconsin defensive line, and then leading to playing sound gap football and leading to the linebackers going out there and making plays. He's playing some great football. He left the game late in that football game. He was uh, seen wearing one of those shoulder harnesses uh, at the end of the game and into the post game. So that's something to keep an eye on. Kirk certainly didn't sound optimistic, but he was listed on the depth chart. And even if he can give them something, if he can give them you know, a 20, 25 snaps, something like that this week, no, he's going to be banged up. But if he can do that and play at the high level that we've seen out of him over the last three weeks, that is so important. We know on the horizon, the possibility of the return of Noah Shannon looks like, again, the possibility of him being back for the game after they get back from the bye week in November against Northwestern at Wrigley Field. So you have that component there. We'll see on YA Black, but didn't get the warm and fuzzy, certainly, uh, from Kirk on that one. Running back position's been excellent. And we, of course, saw last week the monster performance fr from LaShawn Williams. Caleb Johnson, we know how capable he is. And now the return of Jazzy on Patterson, the guy that maybe runs the hardest out of that running back group. Saw some great things from him. Of course, saw the big run against Iowa State. That's absolutely a help. You're going to need everybody, right? And if I was going to play the style that they're likely going to have to employ here over the final games, five games of the regular season, they're going to have to do it with a whole lot of running. And the likelihood when you're playing that physical brand that you're just going to be able to survive on one or two running packs is not very high. So getting Patterson out there, coming off that ankle injury, uh, that's good news certainly right there. Uh, mention Y.A. Black. One other direction that Kirk talked about I thought was interesting was Deontay Craig. Playing inside a little bit more. We've seen a little bit of Jeremiah Pittman. Maybe he's fallen out of favor I thought he was coming on a year ago, and that just has not translated uh, so far this season from the guy that we saw at least bits and pieces from him a year ago. And we'll see. Uh, again, if Y.A. Black doesn't go, well, now you're really getting down there, and the depth of that defensive line is really going to be pushed forward on that front. But I thought that was interesting, Deontay Craig, which is fine. And certainly in passing situations, I absolutely have no problem with that. But this is against Minnesota, and Minnesota has – taking kind of the old style Wisconsin that we had grown so accustomed to. And we talked about that obviously so much last week in the lead up to the Badger game and what they were and what they're morphing into. Minnesota is what Wisconsin was. Huge offensive line, big burly guys, a good running game. And we're going to talk a little bit more about the Gophers coming up here. But Deontay Craig, third down situations, third eight, sure, play him inside. All good with that. Playing him on first and second down against the way that Minnesota wants to run the football gets a little bit more concerning with the 255-pound defensive end playing inside as opposed to a pass rush situation. A little bit deeper on, though the starters are still there with Cooper DeGene at the cornerback position and on the other side with Jamari Harris, the backouts, backups are both out. Uh, Deshaun Lee, who started in the opening couple of games when Harris was suspended because of the gambling investigation, he is... Uh, Going to be out this week once again. And you also saw TJ Hall, who got experience a year ago in Nebraska. Not great, but got experience. He's been out there in special teams and been playing very well on special teams. Both of those guys were out a week ago. Hall looks like he's questionable. Maybe this week a possibility that he could get back. It does look like Lee, though, is going to be out this week. And that means Devin Hilson and Brandon D. Fernandez are the uh, two guys that are waiting in the wings. Saw them out there a lot more. D. Fernandez was out there, of course, in the Penn State game. That didn't go very well, but those guys have been playing special teams. Hilson got an unfortunate penalty in the game. Need reps, need opportunities, and that's what you're looking at. So cornerback depth, well, it was a concern coming into the year, and there was a reason all the way through the summer that I was looking the transfer portal to add some depth 
at that cornerback position. Never came to fruition, and here we are. Now we're talking about a couple of young guys without a whole lot of experience that are sitting out there. Uh, it, in fact, uh, last week when they went dime, just a couple of times they did it, it was not one of those two aforementioned cornerbacks that were out there. It was a Cohen Entringer, who is a safety that, uh, excuse me, came in. It was playing the safety position. So that's how the way that played out uh, last week. There's an update on all the injuries. We get back with the big question, the big burning question, at least to me, and something that I've seen a whole lot on the comments on YouTube, social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. It's been all over the place, and it is the quarterback question. Deacon Hill has not been playing very well. What would it take for them to pull the plug on Deacon and go to the next quarterback in line? Joe Labus. We'll talk about that as we continue. This is the Locked On Hawkeyes podcast. These days, every new potential hire can feel like a high stakes wager for your small business. You want to be 100% certain that you have access to the best qualified candidates available. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the right people for your team faster and for free. As a small business owner, Time is money. And if you're out there trying to do a bunch of different things, trying to find the right candidates to fill in a position, you know that is costing you not just your time, but it's costing you money. Super easy to get a job post up on LinkedIn Jobs. All you do, add your job and the purple hashtag hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile. That spreads the word that you're hiring. And they have simple tools like screening questions makes it super easy to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience so you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and hire. It's why small businesses rate LinkedIn jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. LinkedIn jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. That's linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free terms and conditions apply Trent kind of back with you again on the locked on Hawkeyes podcast as always thanks for making locked on Hawkeyes your first listen every day as we talk about the coming matchup with the Gophers coming to town we know Kirk Ferentz has dominated this series as of late there has been some great games some games that have come down to the wire but I was got the right bounce, has made the right play, and ultimately they have not lost to P.J. Fleck, and that is a good thing because that is one unlikable character over there in Minnesota. But here we are, and looking at this matchup and what it's going to be, Iowa is probably going to be involved once again at a low-scoring slugfest, and it's going to be about making a play. Just think back. How differently... A week ago would have played out without the 82-yard touchdown run from LaShawn Williams. And it's not to say that it was a lucky play because that takes so much away from what the offensive line did. The great run by Williams, him with the stiff arm, the hesitation that he had in the hole, then the acceleration, making a guy miss, the stiff arm, and then the speed to finish it off. So it's not to say that it's lucky, but it is a little fluky, right? I mean, we're talking about a play. This is the longest rush that I was had from scrimmage in 26 years, you got to go back to Tavian Banks in 1997, the last time they had a run that long in a football game. So a little fluky, not lucky, fluky, we'll put it that way. And without that, what is the Iowa game? How does that game play out? Very well could have been much differently. How do you get points on the board? And if you're not going to hit on one of those big ones, you got to grind it out. And you have to make some plays in the passing game. And it very well could be not this week against Minnesota. It might not be in Wrigley against Northwestern or Rutgers or Illinois or Nebraska, but to think that all five of these games that I was going to win each and every one of them, all five of these football games and put themselves in consideration in a showdown with the East champion in the big 10 championship game in order to get there with a sterling 11 and one record. And the nation will be hating the Hawkeyes, and we can just eat it up and enjoy it. That's what I'm going to be doing. But if it plays out in that fashion, I think it is so unlikely that I was going to be able to do that and not get a game where the passing game clicks. What happens if I was down 10-6 in the fourth quarter? They need a touchdown, and they got two minutes left. Well, you got to have your quarterback be able to complete some passes to make that happen. And we've seen Deacon Hill, he struggles. The accuracy is absolutely an issue. Found it very interesting, too. 
as Kirk was talking with the media today, that it was brought up about his completion percentage. And it's not pretty. It's it's hideous. There's there's no doubt about it. But when he was asked about it, Kirk kind of nonchalantly said, eh, no big deal, right? I didn't even know that. Didn't even look that way. I, it The statement that he made about that, I think, said something here about where Kirk is. And you have to be a little bit careful. There's there's some hubris. There's some chiefdom, I'm right, you're wrong, that's going on. I don't believe that Joe Labus is the answer. We saw him in the bowl game. He wasn't very accurate. They didn't put a whole lot in his plate. I pass along the story that Scott Dockerman of The Athletic and on the Hawkeye Beat uh, said to us a week ago where he mentioned that there were some coaches that were completely shocked that he didn't throw multiple pick sixes in the bowl game a year ago. That's what we're working with here. Joe Labus turns the ball over a ton, at least in practice. He makes mistakes. And that's something that is a death knell for Kirk Ferentz at the quarterback position. You make mistakes, you're not going to play for him. We saw the same thing a year ago. You go back to 2021, and Spencer Petrus is really struggling. And Alex Padilla, after the Petrus injury, comes in and did some good things. Beats Minnesota, made a couple of big plays in that football game. Looked all right. Had some struggles also himself. And then the Nebraska game. Didn't play great in the first half. Led him to a field goal late in the first half. They're down 14-6. They made the change, put Petrus in there. Iowa comes back and wins the game. And the narrative is, well, yeah, Petrus saved the day. Not really. Go back and watch that game or even just look at the box score. If you remember, it was a block punt. It was the defense also getting a safety. That's where things came up. And though the final drive concluded as Iowa got the win 28-21 on a Spencer Petrus quarterback sneak to get into the end zone, they didn't even throw the football on the final drive here. So uh, maybe a little bit of a false narrative there. That is something to be concerned about because this thing could get worse. Right now, Deacon Hill is not completing passes. Deacon Hill is not playing at a high level. But you throw in a couple of interceptions on top of this, that's where it gets really concerning. Kirk is not going to make a change unless he is absolutely forced to do it, that there's no other alternative. And he said it in the press conference today. Well, one stat I do know, he didn't turn it over. That's the reason that Deacon Hill is out there right now. And that's the reason that Joe Labus isn't, is turnovers. It's as simple as that. I don't think Joe Labus is the answer. I don't think the answer is on campus. I don't think Marco Lyonez is the guy. And that goes into a deeper conversation. What has Iowa been doing over the last half decade recruiting quarterbacks? I mean, look at the guys that they have brought in. Spencer Petrus, a guy that didn't have many big offers, was committed to an Oregon State program that certainly is not the Oregon State program that we see here today and over the last couple of years. That's where he was. They were, went through a coaching change, and then he became available. Iowa, though, took Spencer Petrus over Zach Wilson, number two pick in the NFL draft, and Trey Lance, the number three pick in the NFL draft. Those were the other guys that they were recruiting. In fact, they decided that Zach Wilson was not as good as Spencer Petrus. We know how laughable that is. Alex Padilla had a pretty good offer list. Not a big guy. Could move around a little bit. He's at SMU now as a backup. Now, is that a recruiting miss? Is that a misfire from the staff? Or were they not able to develop? Carson May. Look, this was a backup of backups, right? Carson May, his offer list included Old Dominion, and Western Michigan. Yuck. Deuce Hogan had a good offer list. And speaking of that game two years ago against Nebraska in 2021, Kirk said if they had to play Deuce, he was going to drive back home. He wasn't even going to watch the game. He said that. And it was an absolute shot at Deuce Hogan. You recruited the kid. Your staff looked at him and said, yeah, this is our guy. Joe Labus. He was committed to Ball State. He had a bunch of Mac offers in UMass. Deacon Hill was on his way to Fordham. What is happening with your evaluation of quarterbacks? Well, here, very simply, you don't have anybody on your staff that can evaluate quarterbacks. John Budmeyer has one year as an offensive coordinator. It went 
terribly. There was a reason he was available last August when they got him. It was because he was fired after one year as an OC, and he didn't have a job. Brian Ferentz has no clue about evaluating quarterback play. I mean, come on. He has no clue as a play caller, but more importantly, he's a quarterback's coach. Does he know anything about the fundamentals of the throwing motion? We have quarterback gurus across the country. And I was got a former offense alignment and a guy that was fired after one year as an OC running things. And you wonder why Alex Padilla can't play at SMU. Why Carson May can't play at Wyoming. Why Deuce Hogan is four string at Kentucky and had to walk on just to get there. The evaluation's been terrible. So you can act like on my pass, looking down at everybody, well, oh, the coaches know something, as Kirk was alluding to today. Oh, we know more than the fans. Absolutely you do. Nobody's saying you don't. There's also a reason that people are clamoring because what you've trotted out there at the quarterback position has been terrible for four years now. The one guy that we got excited about in Cade McNamara was Damaged Goods. That's a guy that had his leg completely wrapped up last December. And maybe we over-evaluated what he was going to be. We got excited, though, because it looked at minimum to be somebody competent. And it certainly wasn't the case before the second injury for him. That was incredibly disappointing. It just, there's parts of that conversation and the tone from Kirk today that did bother me. Did you have it right? Was Petrus better than Padilla? Okay. Was it that significant? No. And that's a problem, too. You had a chance after 2021 to go out and find somebody else, and you refused to do it. We knew that Petrus wasn't the answer. Nice kid. Not a very good quarterback. Well, let's, have, let's have enough of that. Enough with the nice kids that aren't a very good quarterback. This is big boy football. Go out and find them. And if you can't do it with your current staff, find somebody that can. Find somebody that can evaluate. Find somebody that can find quarterbacks. Because I was watching Conference USA football. I've been watching Sunbelt football. I watch the MAC. And we're talking about low-level FBS football. There's quarterbacks out there. And every single year, there are 50, 60, 70 quarterbacks in the portal. You can go out and find them. And if you can't do it on your own, find somebody that can. Because this run of recruiting, the quarterback position, has been brutal. So just because you give us the best of a bunch of crappy options, don't think that you got it all figured out. That's just not right. Gophers, coming up this week. Looking forward to this one. My favorite rivalry game. We will hit on the Gophers and what we expect to see as we continue. This is the Locked On Hawkeyes podcast. Today's episode of Locked On Hawkeyes is brought to you by Prize Picks. Prize Picks, it's a skill based Real money, daily fantasy sports game. How does it work? You pick between two and six players, and if they go for more or less than their prize picks projection, you can win, how about this, up to 25 times your money on any entry. At prize picks, you are competing against other people. It's just you versus the projections. Available instead of battling thousands of other players, including pros, sharks, people that got that big database. Nah, that's not how... This one works. Prize pick entries can be made in as little as 60 seconds. It's that easy. Prize picks offers a recently improved deposit and withdrawal experience as well, including the option to use Apple Pay for quick deposits into your account. So I got my prize picks up right now, and this is what I'm looking at. Thursday night football coming up later this week. We got the Thursday night game. All right, bring it up here. Here we go. I got four picks on this one. So I'm going to take Derek Carr. Less than 239 and a half yards passing. Alvin Kamara, we're going to say this is a run game for the Saints. Oh, more than 53 and a half rush yards. ETN, both teams run the ball. With the injury to Trevor Lawrence, I think you can buy into that, right? ETN, more than 60 and a half rushing yards. And finally, ETN, more than a half touchdown, either rushing or receiving. I like that. So this is what it has. Four plays there. If you hit all four, it's the power play. You get four correct, 10 times the amount of the money that you laid down. Or the flex play. You hit three right, a little better than even odds, plus 1.25. If you hit all four on that side, you get basically two chances at it. You get five times your money down. It is incredible what they have over there with prize picks. Right now, 
Go to prizepicks.com slash college and use code college for a first deposit match up to $100. Again, that is prizepicks.com slash college with the code college. Daily fantasy sports made easy with prize picks. Trent Connor back with you again on the Locked On Hawkeyes podcast. Thanks for making Locked On Hawkeyes your first listen every day. As we roll through, it's time to take a look at the Gophers. Mentioned it. This is my favorite rivalry game. Grew up on the right side of the border, 10 minutes away. Family, friends, Minneapolis. For me growing up, it wasn't about going to Des Moines, not going to the capital city. It was about going to Minneapolis because Minneapolis is closer. Been to a lot of games. I was up there in the Roller Dome uh, back when Iowa had a chance to backdoor their way. What is this? Probably, oh, 93, 94, something like that. If Iowa won, they were going to play in the old Copper Bowl, which was in Arizona, and they promptly blew it. So, been up there for games. I was up there, of course, in 2002. Was one of the first people on the field for the field storming that the Hawkeye fans did and the goalpost coming down. I love that moment. You're sitting in the front row right behind the Iowa bench, and we were some of the first people out there. Luckily, no arrests were made. Love this game. So many great memories of being in Minnesota and Minneapolis for these games, and it's just my favorite rivalry game, coupled with the best trophy, rivalry trophy, I believe, in sports. So what are the Gophers? What are they this year? Kind of like they've been recently, just maybe a tick worse. You look at the statistical profile of Minnesota and what they are right now. Total offense. We know I was struggling. So are they. They're 119th in the country right now in total offense. Rush offense, pretty good. 41st. Pass offense with the Greek freak, Calcamatis, 127. Now, again, we can't be throwing stones over here from what our offense is, but not very good. Total defense, 63rd in the country, 64th in rush defense, 82nd in pass defense. A couple other pertinent numbers for you here on the Gophers coming up. They have been brutal on third and fourth down this season. Defensively, 124th in third down defense and 122nd in fourth down defense on the year. Opponents over are hitting 50% of their third down conversions and 75% of their fourth down conversions. Very simply for Iowa, that's the game plan. Getting those third and manageable, third and three, third and two, and then pick them up. Extend those drives. Another reason for that, as we talked about a bit last week with Wisconsin, is Minnesota is very good this year, again, at time of possession. We've seen Minnesota dominate the statistical category against Iowa recently. They're averaging over 32 minutes a game in time of possession, something Iowa had struggled with mightily really until last week outside of the games, non-conference games against Western Michigan and uh, game one against Utah State. That's something that approved a week ago. Same thing has to happen here. Long extended drives, drives where you get two, three, four conversions, march the football down the field, eat up some clock. Those are going to be incredibly important for this one. Darius Taylor looks like he's going to be back for the Gophers. Really talented running back for them. Seems like they always have it, a big offensive line. Iowa needs to find a way to slow them down if they're going to get the win on Saturday. Not going to lie, going to be a little bit nervous about this one. We'll continue to break it down here on the Locked On Hawkeye, Hawkeyes podcast feed, though. Coming up on Wednesday, Jason's going to stop in. In fact, the return of Stat Boy. Every day, as you may remember, Stat Boy, he jumps in with some great statistical knowledge for us. And uh, Biz says that he's got a couple of doozies for us this week. That's coming your way on Wednesday. Then on Friday, former Hawkeye running back LaShawn Daniels will stop in and we will break things down with the former Hawkeye RB. That's all coming up this week here on the Locked On Hawkeyes podcast feed. As always, thanks for making Locked On Hawkeyes your first listen every day. Don't forget on Friday, college football live. It'll be here on this podcast feed and all the Locked On college feeds. You can find the guys talking about all the big rivalry games. Obviously, a big one coming up this week in the Big Ten with Penn State, Ohio State. Third Saturday in October, that means Tennessee, Alabama, and a whole lot more. College football live here with the Locked On Network. That'll do it for today. We'll talk to you again tomorrow. Go Hawks.